Hello, darlings. You've all heard of Marilyn Monroe. Welcome back, darlings. I'm TV host, entertainment journalist, Konya Guo-Ling, and in just a moment, I have a very exciting interview with actor Michael McClone. So let's take a look at this fascinating actor, star of stage, screen, and film. Welcome back, darlings. I'm TV host, entertainment journalist, Cognac Willow Lane, and we have a very exciting guest today, the very sexy and very handsome actor, Mr. Michael McClone. Welcome to my pink kitchen, darling. Welcome. Thank you, Cognac. Now, Michael, tell my audience, uh, well, first of all, let me, let me tell the audience a little bit about you before we get started into the questions. Um, Michael McClone's best-known movie credits include two casting as a writer, actor, director, producer for Ed Burns' brother in 1995 movie, The Brother McMullen, and 1996, She's the One with Jennifer Aniston. He's also had a large supporting role in One Tough Cop and The Bone Collector. On TV, McClone's credits include Crash, on the stars and the kill point on spike tv as well as a recovering role on cbs's very well received person of interest he is he is also a guest star in the episode of psych voice over credits including the learning channel trauma life in the ER, court tv detective and history's dead reckoning mcclone has also acted on the stage his writings credits include the novels cal and The Roses Dine, Dice, Horrigan Song, and The Soft Drug. He has recorded and produced four albums, Hero, 1999, and To Be Down, 2002, Speed in 2016, and The Center EP in 2017, as well as various singles, including The Other Side, The Hammer, and Thank You Again. Now, my first question is, Tell my audience why, what inspired you to become an actor? Tell us the story. I believe that I was born to do everything that I do, not only acting, but writing and singing and creating in uh, various ways. And through my life, as a child and adolescent, it gradually became clear to me that I kept gravitating toward creative pursuits and performance being the center of attention so that while I didn't have a moment of inspiration that, oh, this is what I'm going to do, there were all of these signals along the way that this, all of these things were what I was meant to do. I read a poem of Edgar Allan Poe's. I read many poems of Edgar Allan Poe's when I was growing up and he was my first literary hero. So in terms of my writing, it could be said that the first awareness of, the first very intense awareness of wanting to do that in a very passionate way came from him. I wanted to write poetry like he did and I had this very strong desire to do that. And in other instances, I would find myself in the woods performing a warrior, or actually when I was 12 or 13, perhaps testament to my Irish genes, I found myself wanting- Is that to what you are? You're Irish? You are well, My Irish. background is Irish and Polish, 75% Irish and a quarter Polish. And I, I found that I, when I was about 13 or 14 years old, for some reason that might be linked to my background and also my family history, I found that I wanted to perform a drunkard in the living room. I was alone in the house and I decided, you know what, I want to see what it's like to look like a drunkard. So I poured water into a glass and I made believe that was vodka and I am staggering around the living room and having a ball. So I realized 
gradually over time that this is what I want to do with my life. And then when I was an adult, I finally made the, the formal official decision to pursue it as my livelihood. Though I believe it was my destiny to do that all along. Do you know what your very first um, serious, what was your very first serious acting role? And how did you get that? Professionally or, or, yeah, or professionally, professionally? Professionally. I would say that it was the Brothers McMullen. I. And that had, was really Ed Burns that uh, cast you in that role. Oh, it definitely was Ed, Eddie Burns who cast me in that role. And he's and like your pal, isn't he? Like a, yes, he's he like a buddy of yours, right? He is indeed. Yeah, and he he's a wonderful indeed. man. Tell and us, a wonderful tell us writer. the story of how the two of you met. Tell us the story. <laughs> it's a great story. Uh, and it will give encouragement, I, I believe, to a, to a lot of people starting out. I had been without an agent initially, as, as most actors are in the first stage of their career. And so relying on the most substantial actors trades in New York at that time, which was called backstage. It is still probably I the most substantial too, actors trades, though then yeah. it was a it was a paper that came out every Wednesday. I don't even know if it's a physical paper anymore, but every Wednesday, I believe it came out and or someday during the week. But I, I recall it as Wednesday for some reason. And one day I opened it and found that there was this film calling for actors that featured three Irish American brothers. And I come from three Irish American brothers. The youngest of the three Irish American brothers in this advertisement was Patrick McMullen. The youngest of our three Irish American brothers, McLone, is Patrick McLone. So I thought, oh my goodness, this is this is a, a blessing and a godsend, and I'm I'm meant to be in this movie. And as it turned out, I was. I I put in a headshot to the address given, and I didn't hear for a number of weeks. And I was very chagrined and surprised. And I thought, did based this, on my name alone, did I should this get a go, call in. Did, did this go directly to Ed Byrne? Did it go directly? I don't know. I can't remember what the address was. But I would imagine it did because he, it was a grassroots operation. He was starting out just like I was in many ways. So it probably went right to him. And it wasn't for lack of interest that I didn't hear for a number of weeks. It was probably just because they were getting all their ducks in a row and organizing to right. have a casting. I finally did get a call and I went in for an audition and it went very well. And, and was then Ed again, there? Was he there? Yes, when, okay. he was. Okay. And I read with him. I read the, the brother's scenes with him. And then again, I didn't hear for a number of weeks and I thought, Gosh, that audition went so well. Why am I not hearing? And then I saw him on the subway. We sat next to each oh other on the subway. Oh, my God. You saw him on the subway? Yeah. And <laughs> I looked at him. He looked at me. And we recognized each other from the audition. And I was so pleased to see him generally, but also because he didn't call me. What's the story with that? I didn't ask him that. But he did say, it looks like we're going to call you. So that was reassuring, and then they did call do me. You think by, do you think of that the fact that you saw him on the subway, at, you know, did you think that counted into him wanting you for that role? No, I don't, I don't think that was the case. He was very taken with me, as he later said in interviews with my first audition. He, he complimented me very highly in a story that he told when he said Michael McGlone was the first person to come into audition. And he was so good that I thought, oh, this is going to be easy. So I think the, the thought that I was right for Patrick McMullen and might even be playing Patrick McMullen germinated at that time with him. So the subway is just a bonus, a great New York story about how two people who were born to know each other had this experience. And so I went in for another call back. I went in for a callback, rather, another audition. And he, after that audition, came out with a copy of the script, slapped it on the table next to where I was sitting and said, you ready for this? And I said, yes, I am ready for this. And we ended up making the film and it went to Sundance, it won Sundance and it created a career for a number of us in the film. It made you 
it, that was really, I, I would have. That was my I first would, professional role on screen. And that was your break. It, oh, definitely. That was your without break. Without question, without question. I mean, and a wonderful I've, one. I've asked a many actors one. that. I've asked many actors, what role do you think was your break? And they tell me sometimes it's been many, many things that they've been in, professionally acting. Sure, it happens for differently for different people, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, there's a lot of different people, uh, you know, they've done a whole bunch of stuff where they had speaking parts and nothing, ever, it, it didn't amount really to much. And here you are, this is your first professional role. Mm -hmm. with a major actor ed burns and it, you were on you're on your way you're on your that's way. that's right and i i, I actually a, a a detail about that it wasn't even originally a professional role if you look at the definition of professionalism meaning you get paid for it because no one got paid for it initially we were all yeah. working for free on the bros of mullen and we got paid after the fact once it's once it made uh, a little right. money a lot of a lot of movies now are like that because you know it's hard to pay actors it's so difficult you know they want mm. to get it off the ground and they're hoping it gets picked up now everybody wants to be on they don't even care about in the theater anymore now everybody wants to be on netflix mm. are you hearing or at that least a large number of people do and for good reason because it's such a wonderful distribution source and a wonderful outlet yeah, Amazon Prime or Netflix, but I'm hearing more Netflix than Amazon Prime. Well, yeah, and there are several others that are, are quite excellent, too. The streaming world is a, a wonderful boon to the entertainment industry in that it has widened the field of projects so dramatically. There's, there's more content out there. There are more jobs out there for people as a result of this widening marketplace. It's so important as an actor to market themselves with good people, to work mm. with really influential people and good people with good connections, because once you do that, you get, you continually will get the roles that you deserve. It, it, it can be very fortunate to be in contact with people who have influence. Yeah. Cognac, no less. I, I feel that what is more important and always is of the most paramount importance is to be true to yourself and to work toward whatever your goal is with whomever is presented, who is a person of character, for you to do that with. So if it were the case that I only was gonna work with people who had a certain amount of influence early on, I wouldn't have made the Brothers of Mullen because nobody in that picture had any influence really at that time. Right. So what right. you said is a, is a very fine point. It's excellent that if you do have connections and contacts that can help you, definitely cultivate them and and, and pursue relationships that are helpful. Though what is more important is to be true to yourself, always be true to yourself and pursue your dreams with an ultimate belief that you can achieve them with the power of your passion to do so. That's the only ingredient I find that you need to achieve everything you wish to achieve. I absolutely agree with you 100%. Always stay true to yourself, always do what you having your heart and what you believe Indeed. in. Yeah, it's the purest it's, it's the purest ingredient that you have for success. And not just that, we all have intuition. We all have yes. vibes about things. You know, we think somebody's gonna hurt us or help us. Listen to your gut. Listen to what's inside well said, you. absolutely. Because absolutely. that if you listen to that, then you know you're doing the right thing. You know, some people always I don't know, I don't know. You trust yourself. Trust your trust your own intuition. Mm -hmm. Trust it. Mm -hmm. Now you also um uh you also did another famous film where you were cast in 1996. Um, she's the one with Jennifer Aniston. Mm -hmm. So tell us the story about how you were cast in that. Particular, and what your well, I, 
I was fortunate enough, as we know, to make the Brothers McMullen with Eddie. We went to Sundance, we won Sundance. And as I said, it created a career for several of us. And there was great interest in Eddie's next movie, which became She's the One. He wrote the part for me, okay. right down to the hair slick back and the smoking of the cigarettes. I was a smoker at that time. And all the bravado and the sarcasm between brothers, which some of which was lifted from our banter as friends. And it was, again, this great gift to me that I was so, so grateful for. So that was, as I say, written for me. And we go into pre-production with me in that role, Eddie in his role, reading actresses for who will be opposite me. And it was an extraordinarily special time in my life. And uh, oh, he, it's a wonderful did, movie. Excuse me for a moment, but did, you, right. did he pick Jennifer? Did he want her solely for that part? Was, was that what he had in his mind for the actress that he wanted to be in? Well, the movie? certainly after she, after she read for him, that was the case though there were other actresses who read with me for that role. Though she was, with no dishonor to any of the other excellent actresses who read, she was the, the strongest for that part, as, as we saw it, as we felt it. Yeah. What was she, what was she like to work, work oh, with? Oh, she was fabulous. She was a- She's beautiful. A, a class act. She's, yes, yeah. a, a stunning woman and a very talented one, a very grounded person, I found, and we got along extremely well. I, I enjoyed working with her immensely. Now, you also had supporting roles in One Tough Cop and The Bone Collector. Now, these were important supporting roles. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about, uh, about this work that you got. Now, this was for... Uh, this was this was TV, right? Wasn't this television or was it film? Also? No, these were films. Oh, they were Theatrical films. Theatrical released okay. films, yes. So uh, they're supporting roles. They're not major roles, but they were important supporting roles. Sometimes it's better to be in a supporting role than it, to actually be the main role because yes, and, sometimes and, you got uh, more uh, leverage, right, about that? Tell my money. Well, I'll tell you, I... What I consider a major role is not necessarily based on it being the leading role or the supporting role or, a, or even less than supporting role, but any role that has the capability for you to put a stamp on it, your, your theatrical DNA on it that has importance. So it could be a cameo like... Alec Baldwin's great performance in Glen Gary, Glen Ross, which is more of an extended cameo, but it's, it's really only one scene that he has in that movie. So I, I think it does qualify as a cameo. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of times too, when you, do, when you do something like that, some actors, they just steal the show. <laughs> well, it's true, and, and, yeah. and sometimes the, what you would call the supporting role or the cameo, has more style, more sexiness, more punch than sometimes a leading role. And frankly, if, if it's a well-written script, I'm in at any level. If it's the lead, if it's the sporting role, if it's cameo, if it's, if it's right. well-written and there's a good group and it has its money I, and, and we, can, we can do some good work here, I'm in. That's I, how I feel. I want to be, I want to steal the show. I want to be in a cameo role and steal the show. Well, that's wonderful. I, I, I don't necessarily need to steal the show, though I do. What I mean is that if, if the project has character and it has punch and right now, you know, it's financing, et cetera, and it's set up in a way that, that, that feels right practically to make the movie, then I, I revel in, in being in it and being on screen and having at least the opportunity to provide a performance that can galvanize an audience. Now, how did you get these supporting roles? I, well, I read for them both, uh, oh. and they were made by 
producers produced by a team, uh, Martin Bregman and his son, Michael Bregman. And I read for them first on One Tough Cop and the director was in that meeting as well. I got that role, I believe with one appointment, though there may have been a callback that I'm not recalling at the moment. With one or two auditions, I got the role for One Tough Cop. And, and were, you the, were you one of the cops in it or were you the bad guy? No, I was, well, it, <laughs> you could say good bad guy because he was okay. a gangster and he was you also look, helping his friend who was a cop. You look like a oh. handsome gangster. You do. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, mean, they that, thought so I, mean, too. That, I mean that in the very best I know way. you do and I receive it that way. Thanks very much. I, I played a, a, an Italian gangster in that. Yeah, you, and, I saw the picture. I saw the picture. Yeah. And I, I play the friend of the central role, which is Bo Deedle, and based on the famous detective, Bo Deedle, who is a famous retired NYPD detective who has a, a world famous investigative firm currently and who also became a friend on that movie and who was a producer on that movie and a producer on The Bone Collector. So the producerial team from One Tough Cop was also the producerial team, at least in large in part, on The Bone Collector. And that's how I got the audition for that and then got the role. Fascinating, fascinating. Now tell my audience, what do you think has been your most challenging role? The most challenging role? Yeah most challenging what was what what did you find what role did you do that you thought was difficult that there was a challenge well you, you always want to do your best so there's always this intensity about that so there's always a feeling of intensity i suppose where that was greatest was i see i've enjoyed making these projects so much that difficulty isn't the first word that leaps to mind. That's why I'm, I'm hesitating to find a role. I, I normally come into the process with such joy that that, as I say, that's not the first word that, that comes to mind with, I don't think any of the experiences though, I would say that one of the most, challenging parts of making movies and television shows is for me has not been in fact the cultivating of the character or the delivery of the character but the technical aspects mm. on Every, set that can yes. limit your capability to deliver the yeah. character because you have all of these technical necessities and they're 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 as I, as I use the word aptly, necessities. You have to do this in order to get the light. You have to be in this position to be on camera. And while technically you can massage these things to some extent, there are still restrictions that exist because of all of this technicality that informs a television show or a film. And at least I, I, I with most, of them, that yeah, is. I tell everybody this. I tell people, uh, they will do the scene over and over again, not because the actor uh, didn't uh, deliver the line the way the director wanted it. It's more right, or less it might be the lighting, it might be the sound, it might be something else. Right. Yes. It, yeah. I was sometimes, the, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say sometimes when you have to be in a certain position to perform the scene, it's not always intuitive to the emotion that you need to perform the scene. So the greatest challenges that I feel that I have experienced have been thrust upon me as a result of the technicality of the art form, yeah. not necessarily the material itself. I was in the movie, The Devil Wears Prada and- Oh, wonderful. Yeah, they wanted me as like a featured extra. But then when I got in the part, when I, I got the part as a featured extra, Meryl Streep said, oh no, oh no. I'm the only one that has the white hair in the movie. So they had to like, oh. they used me 
but they blurred me out like you couldn't really see me in the background so yes. i was upset about that but you know of course miss meryl streep she gets her way uh, yes and <laughs> you know they they make decisions based on what they feel is best yeah. for the film and yes. i don't know if she dictated that or someone else dictated no no that, no, no. she felt, said it she said it David oh, you heard Frank her say it yeah david frankel who's the director um, you know, mm -hmm. of course, he listened to her. And I saw one, they did see, one scene, I physically watched them do this one particular scene 20 times. Her husband was drunk and he kept say, saying, so what are we going to eat? So what are we going to eat? They used that scene, they made him say that 20 times and they never put it in the movie. Never, oh, gosh. never in the movie. 20 times. Was it clear to you why they needed to do it that many times? Not really. I don't know. They just made him, I just kept watching. I was amazed that they made him do it like that many times. And it was like, I kept watching. There must have been something technically. Yeah. Well, I, I would imagine there was something technically they needed to do. Definitely. You know, definitely. And then, and then they made so many scenes, they probably figured out oh, we don't need that. So they scratched it. But mm. anyway, uh, as an actor, do you have a preference? Do you like film better than TV or TV better than film? Now, you've also acted on stage, too. Mm -hmm. What do you like the most? There must be something. I love, I love them all. Really? Television and film are, in my experience, different only in nominal ways. The feeling on set is for me, probably the, the most salient difference about them. The technical process with a lot of shows and a lot of films is very similar. Not exactly the same, but technically very similar, especially if they have a lot of money. Yes, money means I, a lot. Money means everything. Yeah, it, it, well, it certainly can mean a lot. I, yeah. I would say that I don't have a preference between film and TV. As I said before, if the team is right and the writing is strong and the role feels great, I'm in. I, I will say that while I don't necessarily prefer screen acting to stage per se or vice versa, there are differences, enormous differences between the, those two mediums. When you're working for screen performance and you're working for stage performance, it is almost night and day. I say almost because as an actor, you always have to deliver as an actor, period. That's, that's a fact. That's fundamentally true. You have to deliver the character, whether it's on screen or, or on stage. There are things that in the screen process, though, that you sometimes can't do that you can do in the stage process. The stage process, bigness can be to your benefit a lot of the time on screen sometimes it's the antithesis because it's a close-up shot you can't be big you can't be more animated it's a more subtle performance that's called for so things like this are very different about the two processes and also the feeling of going to set to work is they're both extraordinarily going to work anytime as an actor for me has, has generally most often felt great. When you're going to work on set, it is a feeling of great happiness and joy, but it's more relaxed for me. When you're going to a stage performance, it's, there's a heightened expectation yeah. and excitation and yes. anxiety about the show. Because you're afraid you're going to forget you're your to, lines, you're about to right? In front of well, you're about to deliver in front of a live audience yeah. and there's one take. There's not the process of three or four or at least two takes 
I know. I think and a lot so of that. So it's, it's a it's a it's a it's a heightened expectation on the part of the audience and on and on the part of yourself yeah. for what needs to happen. And a lot of actors are afraid to be on stage for that reason. They get tremendous stage fright. But I remember when I was learning how to act, uh, even this was even in high school, this happened to me. I was in a play with John Totoro. You know the actor, John Totoro. Oh, yeah. Right? He's wonderful. Yeah, he's a, we, we were in high school together. That's and terrific. We, we did the scene together. Um, uh, uh, Lady Macbeth was it? I forget now. Was it Lady Macbeth? It was one Sh Shakespearean play that we were in. Okay. And um, he he was right. He wrote everything on the palm of his hand, but I memorized all my lines. So he wrote my lines on his hand, and he was reciting my lines. So I realized what he was doing. Right. So I didn't say anything. And this was in high school. This was mm. in high school. That's a and wonderful was, story. So wait, to, wait till you hear this one. So he yeah. say my lines and I'm like, I'm like listening to him. And then I, so what I did was I started saying his lines. And then he went back, <laughs> then he went back to saying his lines again. And I started saying my lines again, but I never let anybody know what was going on. And neither did he. I don't think he was even aware. So that is fascinating. Uh, this really happened. This is no lie. I and believe then you. at the end of the, the scene in school, the teacher came over to us and said, you guys were amazing. I said, we goofed. Did you notice that? Mm. And he said, no, you didn't goof. You were amazing. I said, you don't understand. He was reading my lines and I was reading his lines. And he says, doesn't matter. You were terrific. You were amazing. So then when I went to acting school, I had kids in front of the, you know, you go up and you do your little thing on the stage, you know, with the class and everything. The teacher, would, they would say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. The teacher would say, never say you're sorry. Just keep going. And that's what I did in high school. I just kept going. That's terrific. Is that, and, and that's, that's fascinating. Really that's a fascinating juxtaposition that the male is reading the female lines and the females reading the male lines. But you know, they, nobody knew what was going on because it's Shakespeare. The kids in the class didn't know what was going on. Maybe the on. kids in the class didn't know, but I have to imagine that your teacher knew. He said, no, he, he didn't know. He didn't know. He didn't. He that, didn't I, 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 I benevolently submit that maybe he was aware of that juxtaposition and that's what he liked most about it, actually. That we just kept going. Well, that you just that you were saying flawlessly the other one's lines, and that you all and that you both did the other one's role to keep to keep it going, to keep it going, and also the 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 fascinating, the the compelling juxtaposition of the male playing the female role and the female playing the male role, especially in something as potent as that play. I think it's fascinating. I think it's wonderful. I'll I'll bet it was. Wonderful. I'm sure I, it was. I often wonder, you know, on and at the end of the year when we graduated, he wrote in my in my uh, class book there. You know, the, the book we get everybody gets in high school. What's that book you get? At the, the yearbook. The yearbook. He wrote, "Remember Shakespeare," and I never forgot that, and I never will that we had that. I was a brunette then. You know, I'm Italian. So is he. He's Italian too. So now getting on to the, uh, the singing, did you always mm -hmm. knew you could sing? I found out that I could sing by trying to mimic Elvis Presley when I was seven years old. My <laughs> father sat me down earlier, earlier in the day that I went up into the bathroom and combed my hair back like him and tried to sing into a brush like him. My father sat me down and said, sit down, Mike, you're about to hear the king of rock and roll, or you're about to listen to the king of rock and roll. Was that your and father's idol, Elvis Presley? One of them. <laughs> and, he, or, or someone, I don't know if he would, use, he would have used the word idol, but he, he, was, he was a singer that my father definitely loved. And he 
they put on Elvis's golden hits. And the, I heard Hound Dog. You're and not the Hound Dog. It was that song. a remarkable experience of being so taken with the sound of someone's voice and the look of their face and their hair. You know, he's such a beautiful man, Elvis Presley. Oh, and his gorgeous. Voice is so riveting. Oh, and my God. He was so I, thought, I want to look like that. I want to sound like that. And I, I went up to the bathroom and I sang into a brush and I combed my hair back, not dissimilar to how it is even today. And you know. I'm singing into the mirror trying to sound like him. And I realized in that experience, Cognac, as I heard myself that, oh, this sounds pretty good. So I, I from there forward, I, I continued to cultivate my singing and it resulted in a singing career. Do you know that uh, Elvis was half Irish too, I think? He was part Irish. Did you know I, that? I thought that maybe there was Scotch-Irish in his background. He's, yeah, there might be he's some... got Irish in his background, but he's also Native American. If you if you notice his oh, face... Oh, yeah, I, I believe a Cherokee, perhaps, yeah, like if I he's remember got the, accurately. The age, the cheekbones, and the, the, the uh, Asian eyes, because that's what Asian... That's what... A Native American really is. You're really, um, you're really Asian. I don't know if you know that. I, I'm, I'm not aware of that as a distinction. No. Yeah, that's you are. They said there's three um, races basically, and they believe that the Asians crossed over North America, or they came by boat, and they migrated to North and South America, and that's real because they studied their DNA, their hair, and everything. Oh, and I see. Okay. That's how they know it's the same, the same hair as Asian people. So that's how they basically think it's the same race. I see. Okay. So I, I studied that in school. I studied that in school. Now, tell us a little bit more. I want to ask you a little bit more before we get into the questions about what you're really working on right now. And but before we get into that, um. You, you recorded these four albums. Was that challenging to do? The recording process has challenges. They're benevolent challenges, like the technical challenges on a set or on stage, et cetera, because they're all a part of birthing something that you love. I won't say that there were, quote unquote, elemental challenges, meaning that it was extraordinarily difficult to do because I had wonderful musicians helping me in the studio create the sound that I wanted. I came into the studio prepared to deliver performances vocally and instrumentally. And so while there were challenges, yes, because anytime you're doing something dynamic, there are going to be challenges. Yeah. There are benevolent challenges. There, there are challenges that increase your awareness of how to achieve what you want to achieve. There are challenges like, like taking a taking a run at a brisk pace. That's challenging. Right. You're going to be challenging yourself to do that, but you love it because that's a challenge that's going to make you stronger and make you better and make Absolutely, you faster, Absolutely, 100%. So that's, you how, know. that's how I look. That's how I look at challenges that exist in the creative process. They're all there to, to result in your betterment and... So yes, there were challenges as there are in all creative There's environments. challenges so in they're, everything. They're one of the challenges. Yeah. Yes, even being a wife and mother and a good human Oh my being. goodness, wow. Those can be even more extraordinary than the creative Yes. Ones. My cousin uh, is a sound engineer. She works for Atlantic Records, but she doesn't work inside the studio of Atlantic Records. They have, they have other places where they do it. She hasn't been doing it for a while now, but mm -hmm. she's a, she, a, she is a record engineer. She's worked with everybody. Her name is Nancy, Nancy mm -hmm. DiLorenzo. That's her Wonderful. name. Mm -hmm. But she's worked for, with, you know, with, I don't know, everybody. Br Bruno Mars loves her. Bruno Mars loves her. He loves her. I'm sure for good reason. Yeah, and who else? She, but she worked even with Michael Jackson. She's worked with everybody. Wow. Cher. She worked with Cher. She worked with Britney Spears. She Wonderful. loves Britney Spears. Yeah, no, she's, look her up. Nancy Diller, she's a sound engineer. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, now you are working on something really very important that's going to be airing on March 6th which is like in a week, 
Less than a Yes, minute. I've already delivered the work and it is gonna air on CBS. Sunday at 10 p.m. on CBS. I, mm -hmm. I play Joey Barada on an episode of SWAT. He's a bomb maker gangster who wreaks havoc in Los Angeles. And that's all I'm gonna say because I want the people who tune in to not know too much about the scenario of Joey Barada on SWAT. You but it play does a happen lot of on Italian. Sunday night, 10 You sure you don't have any Italian <laughs> at all? I'll tell you, a testament to what you said anthropologically before about people sharing their lineage. Finally, we're all brothers and sisters. So I would not be surprised if somewhere down the line there's some Italian. I, I respond so very well to those roles. I love those roles. I, I love, as I say, any role that's written well. I have a lot of Italian friends. I have a lot of Irish yeah, friends. I have Jewish I friends. I can just see that. I, I can see that you have a lot I, of Italian friends. I, 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 I would venture to say that I have friends actually from every heritage, arguably. And a testament to that, while there are certain things physically that, that determine what someone's going to think you're right for, I feel that there's an affinity you can identify with anyone, regardless of their religious background, their, their racial background, etc. And it's something that the more people meditate on, the better off we're going to be. Because the divisions of race, the divisions of religion, the divisions of creed are less real, if real at all. And we, we make a lot of them. We make a lot of them at times that separate us. Because we think, oh, because I'm this, I can't identify with that. Or if I'm this, I can't identify with that. And it's just not true. We, we can identify with a lot more sometimes than we give ourselves credit for. And the more we identify with each other, the better off I feel we're going to be. So an Irishman in the role of an Italian, I think it's I terrific. It. And, it. and, and so and when I see an Italian playing an Irishman, I don't know if that happens as regularly as the Italians playing the Irish, but... Well, but a great example of this is Schindler's List. There were Gentiles playing Jews throughout that film. And the film is made by a Jewish director, Steven Spielberg, who's casting people who are Gentiles in Jewish roles, which for me is a great symbol of the fact that, well, we can all learn from each other and we can all play each other. And we should celebrate this rather than is try to have restrictions against it. I'm trying to think, Schindler's List, wasn't that about a pianist? Was that about a pianist? Oh, I'm, I'm, forgive me. I am, Schindler's List was about the Holocaust, the, right. the, the World War II Holocaust. I, I, and forgive me, I have interchanged that with another of Steven Spielberg's great masterpieces, Munich. Munich was where he cast Gentiles in Jewish roles. Okay. I don't know if all the roles were Gentiles and Jewish roles, but I know Daniel Craig plays a Jew in, in Munich, and I, 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 I believe that he's a Gentile. And there are others in that that I believe, if I'm, I believe that that's, that's accurate. And I thought it was a great example of what I'm talking about, which is that if there's a, a problem with racial divisions, et cetera, it, it exists for all of us. And we all should share in the solution of it. And that's what I saw as a symbol of that. In Schindler's List, I, 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 I want to correct what I had said before. I don't know that he was casting uh, Gentiles in, in Jewish roles. He may have. Uh, I don't know. I, well, I don't know a, that, that as a fact. Listen, there's so many movies out there. We forget. It's fine. Don't worry about yeah. it. I, I, but, I just know that he's made very important films that yes. have to do with anti-Semitism. And for some reason, I, I leapt on Schindler's List when it was actually Munich I was thinking of. Munich. I make mistakes like that too all the time. But <laughs> we all do, we all do. So um, are, there any, are there any actors that you love to watch on the screen? Oh, many. Is, many. Who, do you, who do you think is terrific today? today? Besides. Yes, besides Ed Burns. Oh, yes, who I, I clearly think is terrific. Right. I, gosh, there are so many. <sighs> Sean Bean is a wonderful actor who I'm enjoying in a 
fabulous English series called Time right now. I loved him on Game of Thrones. He yeah. was a terrific villain in one of the 007 movies with Pierce Brosnan, who's another one that I love. I interviewed Pierce Brosnan. Love Brosnan's. to watch. Oh, he's fabulous. I, he's I met Pierce Brosnan at the Hamptons International Film Festival. That's terrific. And, and he's a I wonderful said, gentleman, too. He is. And I said to him, I says, I remember you when you were on Remington Steel. That's how old I am. You're and beautiful he, and, he, and young. And he's, a loving you know, heart is ever young. Remember that, Cognac. And you never get old. You never get old, sweetie. And you know what and he said I'm to so me? I'm so happy that you, that you remember him from Remington Steel. Yes. And you know what he said to me? He said to me, well, you're gorgeous. There you are. So uh, I a said testament to, me, to his, I'm his gorgeous. wonderful you're Irish gorgeous. charm and his great character as a man. He was really- And his great eye, time. because he's obviously very right about that. Thank you, thank you. Very You're welcome. to say that. So now, uh, what's next for you as an actor? What would you like to do? What would you like to conquer? Oh gosh, I, uh, whatever the next role is, I want to do it to the best of my ability. And I look forward to whatever that is. I don't, know exactly what it is at the moment there are some things percolating right now that i'm looking forward to investigating further and there are some things that i don't even know are coming that will be coming that could be that there is a video that i'm going to make with a, a friend and colleague named troy gabaldon and he is a a, a youtube personality who is also a pickleball player who has a YouTube channel called coming in hot, which is in the spirit of highlighting pickleball as a sport and also having fun with the fact that it's a very fast growing sport. And there's a lot of humor to be had in looking at the people who play it and the game itself. So there's a comedic video that we're collaborating on and that we collaborated on writing a script for together that we're going to make. And once we make it, we'll release the video. And he's very hopeful that that will be something that becomes very popular. Please it let is, me know about that because I, I wanted to, when, if that, when that comes out, I'm sure it will. I will let, let you know, know about it let so you can know. see it. And then if you wish to share it, you can as well. Yes. Because he's, He's hoping to bring as much attention to the video as possible. It's a very humorous take on taking pickleball very seriously. And it's, I find, very funny. And I look forward to making that video with him and, and getting it out there. And, of course, I look forward to the SWAT on Sunday night. Tell my audience again what time. March 6th, 10 p.m., CBS, SWAT. Tune in to see me Sunday night, March 6th. Fabulous. Now, I want you to tell my audience where we could go to find out more information about you. Uh, MichaelDeGlone.com. Okay, you're on Facebook and Instagram? I am on Facebook. MichaelDeGlone.com is the greatest repository, though, of Michael McGlone information about all of my various careers, upcoming events, and past events as well. Did Michael, that's your real name, Michael McClone. Michael McClone, yes, is my actual Perfect. name, not a stage name. Perfect name. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect face, perfect name. Oh, you're a sweetie. Thank you so much, Cognac. Yes. And Dwayne. likewise. Yes. So we are going to close out this interview. And I had so much fun talking to you and interviewing you. And I wish I was there to give you a big champagne kiss, but I'll just blow it to you. Oh, thank you, sweetie. Big champagne kisses, And darling. to you. Thank you so much for a delightful interview, Cognac. You are welcome, my love. And keep watching and don't go away yet because we're going to talk after I stop the recording. And we will be back with more celebrity interviews, darlings. And don't forget to subscribe. Pink champagne kisses.
Well, listen to the advice of your bigger, wiser, and more experienced brother. I have a, I have a theory. Man is like a banana, strong and firm, and he's protected by his all-important shield. But when a woman comes along, you know, she sees this bright beast, and she wants it. Come on, Jack. Kiss me. But she's not happy with it the way it is. Ooh, I remember the days when you used to say, I'll never be too tired for sex. So she starts to peel away the all-important shield. First, she wants to see your romantic side. You've never been in love, have you? Then she wants to see your passionate side. And remember, I'm Catholic. I shouldn't be doing this in the first place. Then she wants to see your soft, caring, feminine side. Friendship. Yeah. Not love. No. And she keeps peeling and peeling until you're left there, buck naked, blowing in the wind. Hey, hey, I don't need any new ideas, all right? I'm confused enough already. The Brothers McMullen. Jack. Do you think Jack would ever have an affair? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no way, no how. Patrick. I think I'm going to hell. Why are you going to hell this time? Barry. I'm convinced I'll never have enough interest in any one woman that I'd be willing to give up the joys of bachelorhood. The New York Times calls the Brothers McMullen a terrific, crowd-pleasing comedy. A triumph. Ah, I love you! The Los Angeles Times calls it romantic, charming, and engaging. You know, when you find your, your true companion... Stop, you stop right there, please. Yeah. The Brothers McMullen. Just when things are starting to happen for me, I gotta go fall in love. Winner Best Picture of the 1995 Sundance Film Festival. Where's your sister? I'm in the bathroom primping himself. He thinks we're going to a fashion show, I guess. From the director of The Brothers McMullen. You're never going to make any real money. Look at you. You make a pile of dough and you're miserable. Hey, I'm not miserable, okay? I'm dissatisfied. That's what makes me a success. Comes a comedy about two brothers. What the hell are you doing? I got married. So you had a full 24 hours to get to know each other there. <laughs> I, mean, I thought they might have rushed into this. Their relationships with women. It's actually very romantic. I think we have a problem with our sex life. What kind of language is that? We're on a public street here. And one very awkward situation. Excuse me? <laughs> oh my God, Mickey? Yep. You were up in your ex fiance's apartment today? So my brother came into your bedroom and took a TV. No, actually, I tried to get him in bed, but he wasn't interested. What do you want to hear? Come on, I mean, you, you almost married this woman. It just dawned on me, Freddie. You haven't fully evolved yet, have you? You know, we haven't had sex for a while. Maybe he's having a problem with his... What? You're not familiar with the down cycle. In a relationship, you got ups, downs. Maybe he's gay. Well, I hope that uh, cleared things up for you, huh? You're a sick individual, and you need help. Fox Searchlight Pictures presents... Sort of fun seeing one another again, huh? I'm married now. The story of a family... You're having sex with my head. No. My head. Where men are men. He's trying to turn our entire lives into a competition. All right, no punching below the belt, no kicking, and Francis, no biting. <laughs> women are women. I'm in love with someone else. Who is he? Enough with that. And love is a complete mystery. Let me get this straight. You don't want to cheat on your girlfriend with your wife? Jennifer Aniston, Maxine Bonds, Edward Burns, Cameron Diaz, John Mahoney, Mike McGlone, with music by Tom Petty. A heart so big It could crush this town And I can't go down Your father scares me. I don't think he likes me. She looks like she's from one of the islands. Yeah, maybe Rhode Island. She's the one. You know what, Mick? You never uh, met and got involved with Heather. Where would we be now? It's an interesting theory. I hope you didn't hurt yourself coming up with that one, All-Star. Well, I hope you enjoyed my interview with actor Michael McClone. He's totally fascinating to listen to and to interview, and I really enjoyed my interview with him. And please, darlings, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, my YouTube channel is all about celebrity Zoom interviews with fabulous actors and filmmakers. And I also do shopping hauls like Amazon, Shein, Fashion Nova, Rainbow. And I love you all.
and please don't forget to subscribe. I always publish a video every Sunday or every Monday. And pink champagne kisses. Hello, darlings. You've all heard of Marilyn Monroe. Some of you know Bridget Fardell. dressed to impress one of a kind girl I was brought into this world wrapped up in pearls I love to mingle though my husband reminds me I'm not single I meet and greet both the famous and the elite I ride in limousines drinking the finest champagne wearing fur dazzling diamond jewelry a girl can't complain I live in upscale life, dining in the finest restaurants, eating the best caviar for free. And no matter how much I eat the cognac, ooh, ooh, I sip cognac, ooh, ooh, ooh. This has been a Crybaby Productions, darlings.